We're going to talk today about the most frequently asked question here in this community. This was the question that by far was asked um, the most over the last four or five weeks as we've been harvesting your questions. And it's also the question that is the hardest to answer in a 30-minute sermon. And um, you may be thinking, well, that's, that's good news, Eric, because you don't preach 30-minute sermons. Uh, <laughs> Ha ha, in which case I'm going to pray for your snarky little soul uh, and I'm going to do my best with the time I've got up here. The question before us is, um, if God already knows the future, then what's the point of prayer? If God already knows everything, then why pray? Listen, um, this is a question that all of us ask at certain points in time. I will be honest and tell you that some of the things I'm going to say in this sermon, taken in a vacuum, like if somebody just edits a clip of one of the lines that I'm going to say in this sermon here or there, like it could sound very harsh or insulting even. Just know that I'm coming at this from the place of someone who has asked this question a lot for myself, right? So um, we had a lot of emails that articulated this in different forms and fashions, and we had one in particular that stood out in terms of how succinctly she articulated this question, and uh, this is from a young woman who goes to church here. I'm going to keep it anonymous, but um, if this is you and your email that I'm going to share, I'm not piling on. You're not the only one, all right? You were just the best writer of everyone who <laughs> had this question. Okay, so it's a compliment. Okay, here we go. Uh, she said, if I am driving and I ask God to protect me while I'm driving, if it is in his will for a car accident to happen, won't a car accident happen anyway? And how in the world would I pray, God, if it's in your will, help me align my heart so that I'm okay with getting into a car accident? <laughs> I love the honesty. Uh, and how do you keep faith when prayer after prayer seems to go unanswered? Skeptics would say that they are going unanswered because God's not real. And Christians would say it went unanswered because he has a different plan in mind for us. And so if our prayers are answered, we get to say, see, God is real. But if they're not answered, we still get to say, see, God is real. I was raised in a Christian household and was an atheist for a while before getting baptized several years ago. But I remember when I was an atheist, it would irritate me so much when, a, when Christians said that because uh, then there is no way for them to lose the debate. All right. Um, I really appreciate this question. I think she captures what a lot of us have asked about prayer over time, and she captures what I myself have doubted about prayer as well. And so um, I remember before I really became a believer, one of my favorite things to do was make fun of Christians. Christians are so easy to make fun of sometimes, and there are so many wonderful internet memes that do the work for you. And there was this internet meme back in the day that made the rounds in cynical atheist circles um, that said, arguing with a Christian is like playing chess with a pigeon. No matter how good you are at chess, they'll still knock over all the pieces, poop on the board, and then strut away with their buddies as if they won. <laughs> and that, if you're a longtime Christian and you don't remember what it was like, or if you've never known what it was like to talk to Christians when you're not one, you need to know that's how we're often perceived. Perception's reality, and we just need to sit with that, that uh, for, for these people, this is their reality, and, and oftentimes it feels insulting, it feels condescending to talk um, with Christians um, about something like prayer, because it's a no-lose proposition. If we pray for something and God does it, we're like, yeah, look how great God is, and when we pray for something and God doesn't do it, we're like, God's still great, his plans were better than what I was praying for, right? And so it, it feels incongruent, it feels inauthentic, to people when they hear um, Christians talk about prayer. And in some cases, I suppose it even pushes folks further away. I just want us to acknowledge that um, as part of this conversation. Now, there are a few, I think, agreed upon philosophical tenets that form the foundation of today's question. And those are the basics that um, both theists and non-theists have agreed on, that if God is real, then God must be these things. God must be omniscient. He must be all-knowing. If he's God, then it just stands to reason that he knows everything. If he's God and created the time-space continuum and everything in it, then he must stand outside of that. He must be omnitemporal, right? So in all places, all at once, right? He must be omnipresent in all places, in all times, all at once, all right? And so, if you take those things all together for a skeptical person, it can feel like those, um, those don't add up, 
they don't go together. It's a paradox at best. It's a contradiction at worst. How can God be omniscient and omnipresent and omnitemporal and still give credence to our prayers and change his mind based on what we tell him to do? It feels beyond the, the pale. There's a clip from a YouTube channel called Crash Course Philosophy that I think kind of sums up the more secular side of this argument that will help set the table for the rest of our time. This is like a two and a half minute clip, so check it out. Let's look at this idea up close in this week's Flash Philosophy, to the thought bubble. When people talk about praying for something to happen or to not happen or are otherwise making a request of God, they're making what are known as petitionary prayers. When you pray in this way, you're asking God for something, to help you pass a test or to save a loved one who's in danger or to make sure the Patriots win the game. Contemporary American philosopher Eleanor Stump argues that we have no reason to think that asking God for something would actually make a difference. She thinks about it like this, if God knows everything, including the future, which he does if he's omniscient, and if God has the power to bring about any state of affairs, which he does if he's omnipotent, and if he always wants to bring about the best state of affairs, which he does if he's omnibenevolent, then God has already decided what's going to happen in every single case, to everyone always. So either your prayer is asking God to do something he was already going to do, in which case your prayer was kind of a waste of time, or your prayer is asking God to do something he's already decided not to do because it wasn't actually the best thing. Sorry, patriots. And in that case, even if God would change his mind based on your prayer, you wouldn't want him to because it would actually make things worse than they would have been if you'd just let God do his thing. In other words, if God knows what's best, why would you want to change his mind? Now, Stump suggests that there might be some value in the asking, even if the prayer doesn't actually change what's going to happen. Maybe you agree with her. But at this point, it should be clear just how many problems there are in the divine attributes. All right, so that's a pretty good summary, pretty quick summary, and I like the fact that the Patriots didn't win. So uh, that's why I chose it, really. But um, there's a few things that I want you to keep in mind as we go forward with the remainder of this message. First is that Jesus addressed this very same question and answered it in no uncertain terms in Matthew chapter six, as we'll discover in just a minute. And in some ways, I could just read that passage and we'd be done with this question, but I feel like it deserves a little more of our time and attention. Secondly, I think we should be honest about our assumption, and this is our assumption. Um, I don't know how we got here, but we assume in our time that um, for prayer to work, in order for prayer to be deemed effective, then what must have happened is that God performed to our exact specifications. That's what it means for prayer to work in our understanding today. Um, and if God doesn't do exactly what we told him or asked him to do, then the prayer didn't work. And I wanna call into question that framework, which I think leads people to a lot of confusion anyway. And uh, I think it plays into the third thing, the third point I want us to keep in mind, which is this idea of privilege. Um, privilege is one of those catch words lately, like you can't say it without angering some people and exciting a bunch of others. And, and uh, I, don't mean to, I don't mean to get political with anything I'm gonna to say today, but I do think it's important for all of us to be aware of the privilege that we carry around with us. All right, I think a lot of us, most of us in this room are privileged in different ways. And I just think it's good to be aware of it, especially in terms of this prayer conversation. So um, a few weeks back, I was on Twitter and I retweeted uh, something that, uh, that G.K. Chesterton said on Twitter. And uh, G.K. Chesterton is a, uh, was a 20th century uh, Christian philosopher. He's dead now, but he still tweets, which I think is pretty awesome. I don't know how he finds the time. <laughs> um, he still tweets. And mostly what I do on Twitter is I retweet dead guy stuff. So I retweeted this quote and it, didn't ha it wasn't political. It didn't have anything to do with any like a hot button issue. But like within five minutes of me retweeting this quote, this young person that I've never met, uh, who I don't know and, and she doesn't know me, she replied to my retweet. Um, she said, check your privilege, white boy. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm laughing now, but that wasn't my first response. <laughs> Check your privilege, white boy. And she wrote it, B-O-I, which I think is more insulting. I don't know why, <laughs> but I think I should be more insulted if it's B-O-I. I don't know why. It's just a gut feeling. 
But, you know, you get the notification that, that, that gets you excited and somebody's paying attention and then you check it and then check your privilege, white boy, it's not what you thought. Um, so I was livid, honestly. This 16, she looked to be about 15 or 16. 15, 16 year old young woman who has never met me and doesn't know me calling me out in a public forum about my white male privilege. I didn't like it. I didn't like it one bit. I, I felt, the closest thing I can think of uh, to describe what I felt is that I'm a 40 year old man now, I'm, I just turned 40. I'm gonna say I just turned 40 until I can't get away with that anymore. I turned 40 in September. Um, <laughs> what is time really? I mean, <laughs> I'm a 40 year old man now and here's this 16 year old um, girl, woman telling me that I need to check my, pr- I, I, the only way I can describe it, I felt my inner Oklahoma State uh, football coach, Mike Gundy, bubbling up within me, right? Yeah, like that. Come after me, I'm a man, I'm 40. Is that what I felt like saying, but he says it so well. But anyway, she, she ended up deleting that, uh, that or something. Maybe she was a Russian bot and just uh, got deleted. I don't know, I don't know what happened, but um, it's not there anymore. And the um, only reason I bring any of that up that has nothing to do with today's message <laughs> The only reason I bring any of that up is because it is arresting to be called out on something like your privilege. And if during the next 10 minutes of this sermon, you feel your inner Mike Gundy welling up within you, just know that I understand how uncomfortable it is, right? And this isn't even, I'm not even like calling you out on any certain type of privilege. I'm calling us all out. 99% of us out on the privilege of our entitlement, our sense of entitlement as it relates to how we understand prayer to work. And I hope that we can see that it takes a certain amount of comfort and wealth, privilege, and power to even find the time to ask a question like the one we're asking today. Right? So to call God to the mat and be like, what's the point of spending time with you if you're not going to do what I say? Like that, there's a certain kind of arrogance that's laced in that question, right? Like, and, and, and again, most of us kind of ask this question at some points. I'm not pointing anyone out or, or piling on anyone in particular. I just think it's amazing how blind we are to this sometimes. It's amazing how blind we are to the fact that, let's say, like for example, we've got this team of people from the story that are in the Dominican Republic right now, that are in Santiago, and they're, they've gone to places like the Hole in Santiago, which is the worst part of the city where all the sewage literally goes to. It's literally a hole, and it's a dump where they dump all this, the city waste, and there's parents raising their kids down there. There's people living in it, in the field, in the slop, And I promise you, there's no one who lives in the hole that puts up their feet at night and goes, what's the point if he's not even listening? Like, that's not something that crosses their mind, right? A couple hundred miles from here, there are in, like, various detention centers. There are people that have traveled here, oftentimes on foot or in the back of trucks, in unfathomable conditions, and trading their life savings and in some cases their bodies in other awful ways like to get what we were born with like we didn't do anything to be born here we should wake up every day like the happiest people in the world like the most joyful grateful people in the world to have been born in the place that everybody else wants to get to so bad that they'll do anything to get here and they're living in these detention centers now. Again, not political, not advocating any policy. I'm just saying nobody in those centers is saying, if he already knows, why should I even pray? Like no one, no one. Because when life treats you the way life has treated most people who've ever lived, you pray as if your life depends on it. And I'm not saying that makes your question, our question today, Um, illegitimate or cancels out our question or you should feel guilty for asking that question. I'm just saying understand and acknowledge the privilege of, uh, of having the luxury of even considering such 
a question. All right, um, so it, I hope that as a baseline we can, we can do that because sometimes when I hear people asking such questions, I, I can't help but feel this gut reaction. Like, and I feel guilty about it because I used to ask the same questions, but now I'm like, I'm just, I have this whisper in, my, in the back of my mind. I never say it out loud because I'm a pastor and I have to be nice, but like I never, but I feel in the back of my mind like, who do we think we are? Like, who do we think we are to look at prayer as effective whenever God jumps as high as we tell him to? Where did we get the hubris to talk to God like that and expect him to do exactly what we say? It reminds me a little bit of the book of Job, which I know is not a book that everybody knows about or talks about, but Job is a book that's all about suffering, and Job tries and tries after he loses everything, and his life just gets turned upside down, and he tries for 37 chapters to not criticize God or talk back to God or question God, but then he finally does, and God graciously deals with Job in chapter 38, and then he keeps going for like 12 more chapters. <laughs> God speaks, it's actually in poetry, God speaks in beautiful Hebrew poetry to Job's complaint. And this is what God says. The Lord spoke to Job out of the storm and said, who is this? Who do you think you are? Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. What is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness live? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the path to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born. You have lived so many years. <laughs> Snarky God is my favorite God. Like, I love it. I love it. Surely. Like, <laughs> you have lived so many years. Like, I just, uh, it's hilarious, but also very convicting. Like, who do you think we, you are? Who do we think we are? Are. And I think, um, I know that when some of us have asked these questions, you've asked it because you've gone through something really traumatic. And I don't want to, I don't want to disrespect or belittle those kinds of petitionary prayers where you're just crying out to heaven. Those are lamentation prayers and that's as biblical as it gets when it comes to prayer. But I'm afraid that many of us pray the, or ask these questions about prayer from a place of entitlement. And if you just peel one layer back from that um, question that we're asking, what we're really asking is, why won't God do what I say? Why won't God perform on demand? You know, if he did, I might be inclined to believe in him. But I can't bring myself to believe in a God who won't cooperate with my plans for the world. <laughs> I, think, I think if you peel back a layer or two, for most of us, those are the kinds of questions and assumptions that are on our hearts. And I just want to say that the only circumstance in which prayer works that way is if you're in charge and he's your subordinate. If you're God and he's your subject, if you're the parent and he's your child, if that's how you look at prayer, you'll find yourself stuck on these questions. And why wouldn't we feel that way? Because we've all been raised with such incredible blessings and privilege all of our lives. We've never been told no, most of us. We've never missed a meal, most of us. We've never gone without, most of us. You know, we go through little hard times here and there, but I've eaten every day of my life. Have you? I've even eaten when I fasted in secret. I didn't tell anybody. <laughs> if you've grown up your whole life eating even when you fast, like you're bound to develop this mentality about prayer where of course I get what I want. And that's what it means for prayer to work. And if I don't get what I want, prayer doesn't work. So I'm not gonna spend my valuable time just talking to this guy. If he's not gonna give me what I want, 
I'm going to move on, right? And so there's a deep, deep um, privilege, I think, that's hidden beneath all these questions that I think we um, need to uh, check uh, uh, if, if we really want to find some truth. Um, so you can believe in God or you can not believe in God, but whatever you do, don't, don't make him your puppet. Like believe in God or walk away. People walk away all the time, and that's all right. God still loves you. Don't make him your genie, whatever you do. In Matthew 6, Jesus addresses this question head on. I love that he goes out of his way to address it because clearly it's on people's minds, even back then. Like, we're not inventing anything here. People even back then were wondering, does God already know what we're gonna pray before we pray? If so, why don't we pray? And if not, is he really God? So in Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, he says, when you pray, don't keep on babbling like Pastor Eric, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Your Father knows what you need before you ask him, so don't bother praying, he said. Wait, that's not what he says. He says, your Father knows what you need before you ask him, and then in the very next verse, y'all, he teaches them the Lord's Prayer. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. So pray this way. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Your father knows what you need in heaven even before you ask him. But be sure to ask him for these four things. Your father knows what you need. Ask him anyway. That's what Jesus said, right? He presents this paradox, and in his mind, it's not a contradiction. God knows what you need before you ask, but he calls you to ask anyway. Why? Well, um, many, many years ago, a philosopher named Blaise Pascal said that God instituted prayer to grant humans the dignity of causality. God instituted prayer to grant humans the dignity of causality. What this means is God in his infinite power and wisdom had the ability to create a universe full of drones and robots who have no will of their own, no heart of their own, and who have no stake or say in the way things end up. He could have done that, but he has chosen not to. He has chosen instead to invite us into the process, into the creative process, process that uh, through our lives, we can impact and influence the outcome of things. He wants to teach us how to lead, how to create, how to do. For some reason, he wants to invite us in, right? And I think every one of us, Christian, non-Christian, atheist, every one of us knows that this is true. And I think we know we have the dignity of causality because most of us live as though our actions matter. Right? Listen. Uh, if If you carried out that first little seed of a thought, if... God already knows what's going to happen and how things are going to go, then why pray? If you take that just a few steps down the line, what you'll end up with is a question of if things are going to happen the way they're going to happen, why get up in the morning? This simple little question can very easily over time through a little bit of hardship that makes your hard heart and cynical, like could leave you fatalistic, nihilistic. Who cares? Nothing matters. Why get out of bed? But we know, we know that the way we live our lives, the choices that we make, changes, change the course of events. We know this. Why else would two dozen of y'all have gone out into one of Houston's most quote unquote dangerous neighborhoods uh, on one of the hottest days of the year this week and served meals to 200 hungry, homeless, and near homeless? Houstonians, why would you do such a thing? The bachelorette was on. Like, why? Why go out? Who cares? God's gonna do what he's gonna do. Or if you don't believe in God, things are gonna turn out the way they need to turn out anyway. You're not gonna change anything with your actions, with your food, with your presence, with your hugs. Why? 
Why do you think the people that we sent to the Dominican Republic go there and go there with all their hearts, spending their own money to go there, taking their own vacation days to go there, to go to one of the most disgusting parts of Santiago and hug children who haven't been hugged in weeks and haven't bathed in months? Like, why? Do you think they do that just because it makes them feel good? No. They do that because we all know we've been granted the dignity of causality. We know that we, through our actions, have an impact that ripples throughout life, through, beyond our life even on earth, that we can make a difference. We know this because others have made a difference in our lives. And here's the issue. We have, because we're cynical and, and we like results right away, you know, and we have our expectations, we have separated out our generosity, our social service, our volunteerism. We have separated out our empathy from prayer. And we've said, all of this is what the dignity of causality looks like. Prayer, maybe it's just a waste of time. I don't know. I suggest we take this and put it back in this box. Because just as our generosity and our and the time that we spend serving others, hugging children, all the things that we do to make a difference. Prayer is our untethered, like uh, attention truly and wholly to God and to the things God has us to do. I've heard from so many people who say, I just don't pray for things anymore. Like you used to, but now you've grown out of it. Like that's the feeling that I get. Yeah, God's gonna do what he's gonna do. Things are gonna happen the way they're gonna happen, but I don't, I know some Christians pray for things, but I've grown, I've grown, you know, since then. I don't, I just pray because it makes me a better person. If you're one of those people that sent me that, just know that, I rolled my eyes a little. <laughs> Listen, I get it. I want to demystify prayer as much as anyone. I, in the sense that I want everybody to feel like they can approach God in prayer, I want to take the mystery out of it. But I don't want to take the mystery of the miraculous out of prayer. Listen, I know it's riskier to pray for things, to take a big swing and to pray for healing, to pray for peace. I know it's risky. Because you might be wrong. Maybe that's not what's going to happen right now. But listen, your purview is so limited. Your knowledge base is so limited. You don't know what all God is up to. And you're over there thinking, well, it's not really free will if he's, you know, ordained all things in advance. But maybe he's ordained your prayers as part of the whole. Like, well, maybe it's still not free will. It's his plan. Well, okay, but are you going to take your word or Jesus's? Like, I'll err with Jesus. Like, I'll be the child and not the parent. I'll pray like the child of God that he says I am. And, you know, maybe he's just trying to teach me a lesson. Maybe he's just trying to grow me up. Maybe he has a plan he's going to follow through with regardless of what I say. But I'm going to pray because prayer is not a transaction where I get something from God. It's a relationship that I enter into with God. And he has invited me and you us for some reason into the process. And that's what prayer is. Before she died in 97, uh, Mother Teresa had written a bunch of stuff on her walls. You know how everybody um, puts those inspirational things on their walls at work, like with the landscape and like integrity or whatever, like one of those, you know, those things. She did that, but she wrote them herself, like with a rock in the stone. And after she died, they found one um, near the cot where she slept. And she, some of the examples of these sayings were, people are often unreasonable. Forgive them anyway. What you spend years creating, others might destroy overnight. Create anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. In the final analysis, it is between you and God. And to that I would add, sometimes your prayers are bound to feel pointless. Pray anyway. God may already know the outcome that you're praying for. Pray anyway. Don't pray as though God is your puppet. Pray as though he's your father. Pray with innocence and purity of heart. Pray with expectation and trust. 
Because your Father in heaven loves you so much that he calls you into this creative process of his. He's given you the dignity of causality. And so I would echo what Paul wrote to his congregation in the first century as they, as they struggled with the concept of prayer. He wrote in Philippians 4, 6, 7, don't be anxious about anything. Your doubts, your questions, your insecurities, don't be anxious. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If God already knows the future, then what's the point of prayer? Well, we can take the if out. God does know the future. And he invites, urges you to pray anyway. So let's pray. Father, give us humble hearts. Humble hearts. Break us if you have to. Break us of our arrogance. Break us of our privilege. God, shatter our unrealistic, self-centered expectations of what a prayer that works looks like. Give us new hearts, new eyes to see that prayer that works is a deeper relationship with you. God, give us courage to pray big prayers Trusting you to meet us there in times of joy and in times of lament. Help us to pray as people in the whole are praying. To pray as people in detention centers across this state are praying. To pray with broken, childlike, innocent hearts that seek nothing more than the face of our Father. That want nothing more than for his kingdom, your kingdom to come on earth right now as it is in heaven. It's our prayer, Jesus, hear us. We pray in your